Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Thought Leader Club podcast. Today, this is a very exciting episode because it is the first of a brand new series we are doing on the show, and it is called the Quit Story Series. And the intention behind this series is I really wanted to bring on really cool and interesting people that I meet who have a quit story of their own. And quit stories can look like so many things. I mean, the most uh, natural story that we might think of is like quitting a career. Um, But quit story can also look like quitting a relationship that just wasn't working out or quitting a lifestyle that just wasn't aligned with your values or going on a sabbatical temporarily to rejuvenate. It can look like so many things. But the common thread between the quit stories that we will be hearing on this show, uh, the common threads is that the individual has basically chosen to not fit themselves into a box and check out all the boxes, which is what they might have done previously. But now that they're pursuing their own journeys, they are really choosing to define success or define what a successful life and career looks like on their terms. And they also are choosing courage in times of uncertainty or difficulty. And they are also choosing to uh, make decisions in accordance to their values and what matters to them. So that is the essence of what a quit story is on this show. And the first person we are inviting onto the, the quit story series is Shubham Kushal. And Shubham and I met about a month, a month and a half Probably, ago. Yeah, yeah we're, we're new friends. And we met here in Singapore. We met at an event um, where it was focused on uh, mental health and entrepreneurship. And we connected afterwards. And at first, Shubham actually wanted to reach out to ask me some questions about podcasting. That's true, yeah. <laughs> but then that turned into a conversation about Shubham's own career journey. And I realized that you're a really interesting person that has a lot of view viewpoints. And I just thought you were an incredible person that I really wanted to bring onto the show and really kind of like poke into your brain and I think you have you are an encapsulation of the quit story, in my opinion. So I am delighted to have you here with us. Uh, we are recording this in person. For those of you watching the video version, you will see that there's the two of us on this video. And for those of you listening to the audio, well, you just have to tune in on YouTube to see the video version. But anyways, with all that being said, I'm going to pass it on to Shubham. And could you please tell us a bit more about who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, well, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. I think that was very uh, a little too much <laughs> for my taste, but you know, it's good to hear good things about yourself. Um, so I'm Shubham, and I am a co-founder at this startup called Airboxer. Uh, we do data automation for D2C brands, specifically if you have a Shopify store, if you're running on Shopify we can essentially help you understand all of your data, help you make better decisions. Um, so that's that's what I do. Yeah, just uh, just an entrepreneur, I guess. Yeah, and let's start there. So um, entrepreneur is your job title. Co-founder is your job title. I'm curious to know, is entrepreneur and co-founder the job titles that little you envision like was that even on your mind when you were like let's say in your teenage years or even early 20s no I don't think so I mean I I guess I didn't even know what founding is you know I thought like maybe it's the past tense of the verb find but that's <laughs> not true I looked it up found is actually a word by itself uh, no I had no idea I think uh, when I was younger uh, perhaps in my teenage years it was um you know, it was kind of all over the place. Um, part of me wanted to be an astronaut, I guess. Um, I I did this one paper for NASA in my high school and, you know, designed like a, I don't know what it was. I think it was a search and rescue, uh, some aircraft. 
Like um, you literally did this for NASA. Yeah, there was a competition that NASA hosted. Um, I think it was called the Aeronautics High School Competition or something. Okay. And I was so excited to to do that. I was like, wow, this could be my career. You know, this could work out. What if like NASA calls me and I'm like, yeah, we need you, you know? Yeah. Um, so it was, I was a little bit all, all over the place. Um, I was always interested in, um, you know, in computers and software. Uh, so I knew that that was one path for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a part of me also wanted to study music, which I did not. Uh, mm-hmm. in the end so yeah no I had no idea that I would be uh, running a startup mm. so then tell us more about how you let's say from high school onwards like what was the the path you took like because you clearly took some detours at some point and mm-hmm. end up here today so could you give us a backstory about how you got from there to here sure yeah um, from high school I think if I remember correctly, I was always a little bit of a, I just wanted to do things differently. I did not like studying for exams in particular. I think there were some subjects that I absolutely loved. Um, and depending on the teachers, I would take the appropriate amount of interest in them. <laughs> mm. But I was always kind of like a last minute person when it came to deadlines or, you know, even the NASA paper I wrote in like three days or so just because it was lazy, you know? Um, (laughs) So I think in, and studying in Singapore, so I moved to Singapore for high school actually, Mm. and then university. Um, Back then at least, I think um, it was a, it seemed like a very set path. You're here, you're in a good high school, junior college as they call it here. Mm -hmm. You do your stuff and you you your hard work and you just like, you know, you slog it out. But um, I don't think I ident- I identified with that a lot. Um, and yet, I think part of me was like, oh, I have this opportunity, so I must see it through. I must not waste it. So there was a bit of that push and pull. Um, and I think at the end of high school, uh, when I got into NUS, I had to decide a field of studies, right? Uh, a course. And um, so I was a little bit... Um, torn between studying computer science Mm. computer engineering to be specific or music Mm. which are like worlds apart I think Uh, part of me wanted to do music because I've just been very passionate about it throughout my life since young Uh, and it just seemed like this uh, crazy thing to do um, as an Asian student Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, computer engineering had all the security with it because, yeah. you know, um, usually a, a good career choice. I think back then, perhaps it was not the most popular field of study. Mm-hmm. Um, today it is for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was one of the turning points where I actually chose the safer path. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like, OK, let's not take too many risks. You can always come back to music if you want to. Yeah. Uh, let's build a solid career first. Okay. So now I think um, I'm really curious to know um, about your cultural background, yeah. perhaps, because I think, um, you know, the audience now heard that you're, you're current, we're, both of us are currently in Singapore, yeah. and you moved here for high school. Where were you from before? Yeah, I grew up in New Delhi, mm-hmm. in India. Um, that's where I'm spent most of my uh, schooling in mm-hmm. um yeah so new delhi my parents are actually from the mountains mm-hmm. from a state called himachal so i guess yeah i'm from india <laughs> and uh specifically grew up in delhi okay so i'm curious to know from your own whether it's family or culture how would you like would you say that your family or culture had some sort of influence over that specific turning point where you were choosing between music and computer science? Yeah. Did your family play a role in your decisions? Absolutely. I think as a as a uh, you know nineteen year old Asian student, you're still very much living under the shadow of your family. Yeah, that's a great way to phrase it. Yeah, it's. I think. 
it comes from a place of uh, self-preservation, right? Like I come from a family which, uh, like I we grew up, um, I would say middle class at best. Um, in fact, I think I remember that the first 12 years of my life, I was uh, living in what you call a joint family. Uh, so here you have, you know, your immediate family, your parents, your siblings, but also your uncle's family and your grandfather and your grandmother. So it was quite a basic sort of upbringing, right? And for my parents' generation, their uh, biggest and well-deserved achievement was to find a stable, secure job that pays consistently and, um, you know, something that can sort of help lift the family up. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think they, uh, that's the kind of thinking they were trained in is to not take too many risks yeah. and just follow a set path, do your thing, do your hard work, and then, uh, you know, work towards that. So when I was deciding uh, what to study, I think that definitely factored in. I remember having, I think my parents uh, honestly were um, quite supportive, I think, um, of whatever I would choose to be. Uh, but I had a hard conversation with my sister who was uh, who believed that you know what I think you should do computer engineering because it keeps the options open um, you can do that first and later on if you want to do something else that's always the case whereas if you study music um, you know it's a tough life for sure um, building a career there is not easy and then if you want to switch your career back it would be a lot more difficult and honestly, I think back then it, it made sense. I was like, yeah, I can't really argue with that. So that was that was uh, definitely a, a factor. Yeah, I this hits home for me a lot because um, having I was born in the United States and I grew up in North America primarily. Mm -hmm. um, and my parents were immigrants to there. And I have in my, I've, I've always had this narrative inside my head that my parents worked so hard to give me the resources I have and they worked their hearts and asses <laughs> off, honestly, right? So I felt like this sense, there's, I've always had a story of like, I will give back yeah. through my career. Yeah. And my, I've told my mom that not too long ago and she's like, where did you get that story from? Mm. And I'm just like, I don't know where I got this story from, but I thought it was, it, it, it just was something I internalized since young. Mm. And so when I quit law school, um, I think it's five years ago at this point, when I quit law school, um, well, my parents were furious at that point yeah. because at that point, um, now they're much more open to my not so traditional career decisions. But five years ago, that was not the case. And when I quit, they couldn't understand why I couldn't just mm. finish the degree first and yeah. at least have a degree. And they're like, I think in their minds, um, I think, oh, when I quit, my mom actually said, you need to bring harmony back into the family. Wow. And I was, and, and that's when I realized how much for some of us, maybe for certain families or certain cultures, the career decisions we make yeah. kind of influences the family dynamic um, more than we can imagine. And I didn't yeah. realize, um, you know, how much my family really were, um, kind of like following along what I do and mm. secretly hoping I would go this direction or that direction. Yeah. And that came to light when I decided to quit law school. Mm. So that's why I was really interested to hear, um, you know, your, your family or um, yeah, what your family had to say. Is there any um, particular experiences that you might be able to share when it comes to your family? Um like where else did they kind of plant the seeds mm -hmm. as to like, oh, you should go down this career path or that's yeah. not what we do? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I think I don't actively remember such instances, but you're absolutely right that, you know, when you said that um, you were wondering like, when did this get imprinted on you that you're supposed to give back through your career? It's such a... Uh, pervasive social programming that most I think p 
people who are born and brought up in Asia go through. Like it's a very familial, you know, family. Family is the most important thing growing up, right? Because they take care of you and then the uh, unsaid expectation is you're supposed to give back and take care of them. You know, which I I agree with. I think that's 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 something, it's also one of our strengths, I think, as culture, mm-hmm. um, that we stand by each other and all of that. But it does take away uh, the power of the individual a little bit, their potential uh, as a human being a little bit. Um, it takes away their options, right? It mm-hmm. takes away their uh, adventure almost. Like sometimes you just want to try something crazy. It doesn't have to make sense. Um, but when you have bigger things to worry about, you limit yourself. Um, so I think the programming sort of happens, not just in your family, but just hanging around with, you know, similar people with their own families who think the same way. You just observe, you know, that this is how life is supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. There, this actually reminds me of um, something that a comedian named Ronnie Chang, I don't know if you're familiar with Ronnie Chang, but I believe um, he said a, a joke one time and it was like something along the lines of Asian parents want their kids to become doctors because in just one generation, they can turn it around. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's, that's <laughs> a great way to put it. Yeah. I think that's they're looking for that uh, exponential growth through yeah. generations, you know. <laughs> generation, you can turn it around. <laughs> yeah, and they've done it right for the previous generation. Like yeah. my my grandfather, he uh, he had real struggles, so to speak. Mm-hmm. You know, um, the stories that I heard about him that he built this home at night because during the day the uh, you know it was during the British Raj in India and they would not let people build houses. So he would just put himself through school, pulled him up from his bootstraps, and he provided this safety for my father to grow up. And then my father followed on. Mm-hmm. And so you're always supposed to sort of keep going up. That is the expectation, mm-hmm. uh, almost. Um, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I think I I really resonate with that because my 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 father especially loves to imprint certain yeah. values in yeah. me by sharing yeah. stories of his own upbringing and my grandparents um stories as well and hey let me tell you it worked <laughs> it <laughs> works really well are deeply imprinted yeah. in my brain. <laughs> um but now let's let's jump back to yeah. near present day yeah. so it's university for you mm. you're at nus um i mean from nus to now like what yeah. happened yeah so i think choosing um Computer engineering was back then the the right thing to do, um, and I did that. I went through the course. Um, I think I think I quickly realized that um, <laughs> I again, once again, do not like to follow a set path. Um, I would just show up really late for my lectures. Just just skip them entirely. I was a I was not the best student, I would say, when it comes to NUS. Uh, they, they have this, uh, uh, it's a boon and a bane. Like they have the webcast of their lecture. So they're like, even if you don't go, you can watch them later. Mm. And every semester I found myself just putting it off until it was exam week. And then of course you can't go through them, even if you watch them at 2x, of course not. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think academically I did the bare minimum. Mm. But I also realized, um, you know, what is it that I actually like about school? And I think in my course around the third year or so, it started to get a little bit more interesting. There were, um, the focus was a little bit more on projects rather than, uh, you know, examinations. So like 50% of your score will be determined by the project. And that, I think at that point, I started to take in, take a little bit more interest in my in my education so um and then i started um just picking up uh work here and there you know started with a a few internships um went for this industrial attachment at autodesk and then uh found this program that nus offers called nus overseas college which is um actually a program centered around entrepreneurship so you would get attached 
to a startup overseas. You'd go there, it goes from six months to a year, whichever you want to choose. Uh, and I applied for it and um, actually went and worked uh, at a startup called CallApp in Israel um, back then. And I think that experience sort of uh, really sort of opened up my worldview because it was also the first time that I lived in a country that was neither India nor Singapore. Um, so a little less Asian, you know, in terms of individuation and, and risk taking. Um, and I think that was that was one key turning point where I was like, OK, this is this is a non set path sort of exploration. Um, and I really enjoyed my work there. I was very inspired by the people that I was working with, uh, just a small team of eight people and just, you know, making a huge impact. Mm -hmm. And I came back from that. It was fourth year. Um, and I think slowly and slowly I started to realize, okay, I think this is the kind of work that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. So when I was about to graduate, I had um, two options, essentially in terms of my first job. One was uh, start my career at Citibank uh, in their uh, software team or whatever, in their technology team, or join this obscure startup that I'd never heard of uh, called Chaldal, which is essentially the Red Mart of Bangladesh now. Um, back then they were really small and just, I didn't know what it was. Um, I got to know about it through a friend. I had a quick in-person chat with one of the co-founders who was visiting. Um, surprisingly, this person had also gone to NUS, so there was some common thread there. And the chat went great. Uh, he just sent me some take-home assignments, and you know, I got that job. And I was like, hmm, which one should I, which one should I take? Uh, and I was like, at this point, I'm old enough to, you know make my own decision without consulting my family <laughs> and you know and also uh, both of them paid <laughs> so mm -hmm. it wasn't like I was breaking any rules you know uh, so I went with the more crazier option back then and decided to join this this startup and just you know went ahead into that direction of a small company wide just trying to do more with less um and yeah, I think that was that was probably one of the inflection points as well. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so I'm really curious to know from that point onwards, mm. from that particular inflection point onwards till now. So today mm -hmm. is November third, twenty twenty three. Mm. From during this time frame, like I'm sure you've also maybe dabbled in different um, startups or spaces as well. And we can dive into that as well. I mean, now you're, you're, you co-founded your own thing, but like, were there any points where you're like, oh, why did I go down this oh, road? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, can you dive into that? Sure, happy to. Um, I think, you know, th there's the way that I look at it is uh, at, all of these junctures, uh, these inflection points, you essentially have a binary choice. One is to walk down a road that is uh, very well lit up, uh, very well paved. It seems safe. It seems predictable. And then there's a small alley, dark alley that you don't really know where it leads, um, but it could be exciting. There's some promise based on other people who've told you about it. You've heard some rumors that this could be interesting mm -hmm. and that you might find something, uh, something new there, you know? Um, so, you know, deciding to, to take that job at Chaldal was one of those points. Uh, but it didn't really end there. Now, the thing is that if you take down, if you take this path, as you're walking through darkness, really, um, you are filled with self-doubt all the time. Because um, I think most of your peers, especially in a, in a place like Singapore, uh, are not on that path, right? Or they were not, I think today, uh, Singapore is a lot more supportive of uh, you know, new ventures and startup, and it's, it's a hot thing these days. 
back then, not so much, you know. Uh, I think back then, even the big tech had not showed up in Singapore. Uh, the top sort of, uh, you know, uh, players in the market were the big banks. Mm -hmm. even, even in computer science or engineering, uh, those would be the highest paying jobs. So you look at your peers and you hear their stories and they sound like, you know what, they they work, or they have a good work-life balance, everything's taken, they get a bonus, you know, they, they get, uh, they seem to have a bit of a balance. And so you're filled with self-doubt throughout, even working at a startup as an employee. Mm -hmm. um, but I really think that that's a good thing. Um in a way, I think looking back at it, I I had a bit of a quarter life crisis. And as I went through it, I was like, you know what? I think this is what people go through in their midlife, actually. If they have a very stable career and if they follow every, if they do everything right, perhaps they, you know, um, find a partner and have babies. And I think at some point they must wonder why or is this it, mm -hmm. right? And I think in a way, I felt a little bit fortunate to uh, to find myself in that headspace at 25, like uh, three years into working at Shaldal. You know, at this point, I had um, I had gained such a great experience working there. I got to build amazing software systems. You know, uh, I had a really good supervisor. Um, I just like absorbed everything like a sponge. Um and um, I was doing well mm -hmm. from all accounts. And then uh, about three years in, I was like, okay, but is this it? Mm -hmm. You know, now what? Um, so I think um, to look back at it, um, and I kind of forgot what we were talking about. Uh, um, we were talking about, did you ever, like, at any point from... Yeah. And US till now, yeah. or no, no, when, when you got your first job after graduating till now, did you ever look back and was like, why am I doing this? Yeah, many times, mm -hmm. many times uh, during the job, yeah. um, after I went on a sabbatical, that was oh, that's again, another story. We're that's another get. story, sure. Um, and even to this day, even to this day, I think um, it's uh, it's something that we don't usually openly talk about. Mm -hmm in our especially in our culture i think yeah. um you don't want to come off as someone who doesn't know what they're doing mm -hmm. uh, there's a bit of that saving saving face kind of a thing there mm -hmm. uh, but even to this day there are times when i'm like oh um am i doing it right uh you know is this is this the right thing to do yeah i can imagine like for myself whenever i i open my linkedin app and i see my friends, my classmates who are yeah. now medical doctors. They got yeah. the finisher PhD. Yeah. I'm like me who quit after like two mm -hmm. years of her PhD. And um, because I come from a science background. So mm -hmm. a lot of my my friends back then are now like scientists or like dentists and et cetera. Yeah. So there, so I, I'm curious to know, like, you know, when, I mean, even to this day, I'm, I'm curious, like when you go on LinkedIn, do you, ever still wonder like huh what if I went down another path yeah absolutely comes up. yeah mm -hmm. it comes up I I don't browse LinkedIn that much that's uh, smart that's a, that's, that's a good decision that's a good decision <laughs> uh but yeah it definitely comes up I think uh all those paths not taken it's like wow this could have been me you know and being an astronaut could have been you also. Yeah, sure, you know, in some parallel universe, probably what I am. What else did you consider? Okay, so, so we got startup founder, we got um, computer, uh, yeah. computers, engineering, we got astronaut. Is there you as music, musician? Musician, yeah. Was there any other option we could have considered? <laughs> I could have taken that job at Citibank and had a very nice, you know, career, build a nice team and mm -hmm. enjoy my weekends, <laughs> you know. City never sleeps, though. That's what I heard. <laughs> That's true. Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, countless, I would say, countless. Mm -hmm. um, all those uh, possibilities uh, that could have been, uh, you wonder sometimes. Yeah. In yeah. a good and a bad way, you know. Yeah, yeah, sometimes I still wonder, huh, should I have gone to medical school? <laughs> Taken the MCAT and gone to medical school, would I have even gotten in? I yeah, don't know. Yeah. Okay. So 
Um, I really appreciate you for uh, sharing openly about how even to this day, it's mm. not like, it's not like the basically self-doubt still yeah. clouds yeah. maybe your head here and there every day uh, or, or nowadays. So I, I want to kind of um, jump to present day and ask about um, just because I think nowadays when our listeners think about like entrepreneurs, whether it's um, and entrepreneurship can look like so many different things mm. nowadays. But I think the general image that people have of entrepreneurs is like, wow, they're so much grit, so much resilience, so much work ethic. It, it looks so cool, like. Silicon Valley, like I think there's certain narratives that we now have. It's that, romanticization of yeah, romanticization of entrepreneurship. But how would you like if you were to talk to a fresh grad mm. in 2023, like how would you like give them an honest depiction of mm. entrepreneurship? Like what would you say? That's a really good question. Um I think you're right. There is a certain image um of uh you know, founders out there. Um, part of it is, uh, you know, it's keeping a brave front or mm -hmm. of course you don't want to share like uh, the sad things, right? You you only share the good things on social media. That's the, that's mm -hmm. the whole point of it, I guess, which I don't get. Um, and I think uh, entrepreneurship especially more so than other career choices is actually a graveyard of failures mm. and it's there is so much more that you don't see that is happening behind these um one percent who are doing amazingly well seemingly seemingly you know i'm sure they have their own struggles that they don't talk about but it's not cool to talk about that right it's cool to talk about uh I don't know, tens of or hundreds of millions of dollars that you're raising and uh, cornering this market and this and that. Um, yeah, uh, so what would I say to a fresh grad perhaps? It's interesting because just uh, earlier this week, I was helping out um, my university interview some people for the program that I mentioned, the NOC program. And it was really good to go back to that uh, state of mind, like, cause I also went through the interviews and I was just remembering like, uh, you know, uh, what kind of person I was back then. I think during that time, you are uh, a bit of a clean slate, right? You are ready for anything. Perhaps the people who apply for this program already have a little bit of that spark. Um, and I think what I would say to them is that this path is not uh, glamorous at all, uh, in my humble opinion. I'm sure that different people have different experiences, uh, more so, I think, in the, in the entrepreneurship lane. But this path, for me, has never been glamorous. It has been a path, uh, it, it has been a path of self-discovery, perhaps, uh, of self-actualization, of uh, proving it to perhaps yourself uh, more importantly than others, that you can do something big, that you're capable of doing something big. And, um, uh, you know, you just, I think that's how I would put it, mm -hmm. that don't do it for, you know, the success of it perhaps mm -hmm. that's definitely something you want to aim for you know of course you should be highly ambitious and I am um, but the experience of it is something unique that will teach you so many things about yourself um, I don't know if I'm making sense and I don't even know if that is a pitch like if I could discourage them from doing this I think that's a good thing mm -hmm. if I can talk you out of it that means that you should probably not do it that's a great way to put it. Mm. And I, I'm so glad you shared what you just shared, because even though I would say the majority of our audience are not fresh friends, mm. um, I would say that um, based on what I know about the listeners, um, most of them are, um, they've worked for at least maybe like five years, 10 years, generally speaking. Yeah. Um, 
but many of them are curious yeah. about doing something of their own and that's a very vague term right now it, it might still be fuzzy in their heads but they there's something in their heads they want to do whether it's being yeah. a content creator or maybe being a founder mm -hmm. or starting an online service-based business it could be anything but they are at a point in their life and that's probably why they're listening to this podcast yeah. they're at a point in their life where it's kind of like a mid-year life mm -hmm. crisis a yeah. quarter life crisis they're like yeah. huh I mean, things are fine, yeah. but it could be better or it could be different. Yeah. And I think that's a, a sentiment that a lot of the listeners yeah. share. So with that being said, is there, as someone who is a founder yourself, mm -hmm. is there anything you would say to someone who might be whether it's older than yourself or has more yeah. industry experience than yourself, but now they're like mm. at their own crisis of some sort mm. and they're looking at your, your interview right now. They're like, like, what would you say to someone who isn't a fresh grad, but is at a similar juncture sure. mindset wise? Yeah. Um, and, you know, even for the fresh grad, I mean, I did say that mm. if I can talk you out of it, uh, you probably shouldn't do it, <laughs> but if that doesn't discourage you mm -hmm. and you're still on it, then I think that's where the real conversation starts. Mm -hmm. um, and this goes, uh, like you said, uh, for someone early in their career or in, in the middle of it, or even looking for a career change for that matter. I think if you still have that nagging feeling inside you that this is not it, or perhaps life could be different, um, then you have you owe it to yourself to listen to it and act on it. Yeah. I think uh, what I would say is, look, everyone's situation is different, right? In a way, I was fortunate that I was at a point in life where I didn't have a lot of responsibilities. Um, you know, um, I was still early in my career. I was like, I didn't have a very lavish lifestyle. I was never, I never got used to that. So I was good at saving money. I saved some money from my first job. And I and I think that's partly why I got this nagging feeling like, yeah, I'm saving money and it's probably going to keep on going up. And then what? Like, you know, is this it? Mm -hmm. um, so for someone in that position, I would say just go for it. Take the risk. Take the plunge. Uh, make sure that you are able to sustain yourself mm -hmm. through that. Uh, like I managed to last, I think, uh, 2019. Yeah, managed to last maybe two and a half years uh, without a job. Like I went on a sabbatical and I just never went back to the company. <laughs> and that was because I had uh, this sort of financial, uh, you know, uh, mattress that I'd built for myself to bounce back on. Um, so if you don't have a lot of responsibilities, absolutely take the plunge see it through, you know, stick out, stick it out um, to the end. And because you owe it to yourself, absolutely. For someone who, you know, when people uh, get older, they do accrue more responsibility. Perhaps you have a partner, perhaps you have kids, you know. Um, in that case, I think um, it's contextual. And I think in that case, you need to perhaps do a little bit of risk management. You, you don't want to be too outlandish either. Perhaps you can start something on the side without quitting your job or, uh, you know, quit your job, but have, but find a way to earn money somehow, some basic amount, right? Do consulting on the side. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, when I started this company with my co-founder, Saps, um, we both started um, with the idea of actually bootstrapping it. We were mm -hmm. like, you know what, we'll just uh, perhaps get a few, uh, some contract work here and there, and we'll keep exploring this as a hobby. Uh, ideally, we never have to raise capital and we can just take it off the crown. Now, one thing led to another, and as we were exploring the problem, we realized it's a big problem, mm -hmm. uh, which needs to be solved, and people are trying. And then eventually, we decided to raise capital um but we started with that mindset because we were gonna get like some basic you know sustainable sustenance money every month just mm -hmm. to make sure we we're paying the bills and feeding ourselves mm -hmm. and then you know um 
put the rest of our time in in exploring this. So I think it depends where sure. you're at. I think you have to uh, understand what you need uh, on a daily basis. Make sure that is covered. Uh, make sure that your survival is not in danger. And from there on out, it's everything else is a bonus, I think. Mm. Yeah, I think what you just shared is particularly helpful for those who are um, not a fresh grad and they have yeah. more responsibilities, um, but also perhaps more of a financial safety net as well. Yeah. So a lot more um, factors to consider, but you can also probably buy yourself some time at this point. Yeah. Um, I am one one um, profile of a person popped into my mind as you were sharing. So I have discovered that actually a number of our audience members of this show uh, are holders of PhDs. Oh. So uh, because I myself was in a PhD, so I think over the years I have um, kind of like accrued a, a bit of a uh, audience base who also are PhD students or mm -hmm. you've already gotten your PhD. But one thing I've heard from some of our listeners who have PhDs, and I'm sure this applies to any tertiary degree holders, is that they feel like they've put so much into this mm. darn PhD. Yeah. And now they're thinking, I don't think being a professor or mm. going down academia is it for me. So I know you weren't in academia or you're not a professor, but you've gone down something similar. So I'm curious to know, like, what are your thoughts on having, like, and, and it seems like you've had several junctures of your, your, your journey so far where you have invested time and energy yeah. and hard work into something. Yeah. Um, but at some point you realize like, oh, I don't think mm -hmm. there's much of a future yeah. here anymore for me. But like, how did you navigate the feelings of, but I've been here for like mm -hmm. three years. Yeah. I've done this for so long. Your identity is wrapped around mm -hmm. that role. Like, how did you unravel that identity that's a really important question i would say um and you're absolutely right i um i haven't been into academia but i have hung out um you know uh, or been around a lot of phd people um i was part of this um, startup program called entrepreneur first and their singapore chapter uh, it's closed now, but back in the day, um, they were very deep tech focused. So almost one third of the cohort were PhD students. Um, and it's very interesting, I think, um, made um, great friends there, but it was very interesting to observe how they think um, and how they approach the program. Um, I think you're right. When you do something like a PhD, it, it becomes such a big part of your identity. Uh, for me, I can't say that I've gone down uh, that uh, that road, but I have, you know, uh, at some points, like perhaps it was a passion project of mine that I tied myself to. I was like, okay, this is it. I tried to solo found this, this company and I worked on it for six months, uh, day and night, you know, I was like, just, yeah, just one person army, you can do it. And wrapping that up and saying that, okay, this is not going to work was a difficult and emotionally difficult process. Um, how did I do it? How did I get around it? I think I sulked for a while. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> I entered, I started entertaining the idea that, okay, perhaps this is not really working out. And maybe we could make it work. Maybe, maybe we could find a, a business partner and really, you know, try and see it through. Do I want to do it? And do I feel excited about that prospect? Or does it feel like I am just uh, sort of carrying this load on my back and seeing it through just because of, it's a bit of a sunk cost fallacy, right? Right. Absolutely, just like that, just maybe a little bit more on the emotional level because your entire identity has perhaps warped around it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's never an easy call. And I think there's probably no uh, no combination of words that uh, can convince you to take that leap. I think it's it's your choice. It's mm -hmm. your, you have to decide for it. But it's important to remember, looking back, that um, 
no one thing can ever define you, right? It, I mean, I think entrepreneurs really suffer from this because um, our startups, our, our ventures are really like, you know, a big part of what we do. Um, and our identities are tied up with it, um, intertwined with it. Uh, but even in that uh, situation, like even today, it, I'm four years into this startup, you know, we've made some pivots. I love it. I enjoy it. Um, I hate it too sometimes, <laughs> like you should. It's a mixed bag of feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but even today, I think I try to remind myself that this is not the entire definition of me. Mm. I am a lot more than this. Um, and so are you, right? As a PhD student, as a lawyer, as a politician, for that matter, like uh, you're not defined by one. You're not one dimensional. Mm -hmm. So if you perhaps remind yourself of that, uh, perhaps you'll feel a little bit more at ease entertaining the idea of uh, closing this chapter down or maybe just putting it on pause mm -hmm. and seeing what else is out there. Mm, I think that's a great um that 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 really ties in with the theme of the quit story mm. you know the, the the name of this series that we're doing on the show um i i really love how you you talked about we're more than mm. just our work we're more than just one facet of our lives yeah. um and, you know, I, I would love to take some time before this episode wraps up to talk more about the multi, the multi-dimensional sides of you. Sure. Really, I, I really want to dive into um, the music side of you, uh, actually. Um, but before we do that, I do have one more question I want to ask uh, related to, I guess you can call it quitting, but I, I want to know more about your thoughts on failure in particular. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if any listeners right now are building something of their own. And it's just not working out, mm -hmm. whether it's a side hustle, a business, a podcast, uh, maybe you found a start of yourself, but it's just not working out. What would you say to someone who might be at that crossroads? Mm -hmm. It's difficult um, to come to that realization or even that feeling that uh, something's not right. Yeah, it's a difficult feeling to confront. I think in the past, um, I did not have a good relationship with failure. Mm. I don't think most of us do in this part of the region, in this part of the world. Uh, there's there's feelings of shame associated with it. Uh, you, when you entertain the idea of quitting this, you wonder uh, what are people, how are you going to answer people, you know? Um, and people are going to ask you questions and oh, but you spent so much time on doing this and now it's over. And, you know, these are the thoughts that you play with. Uh, it's not easy. Um, and I think the reason that it's, I mean, the fact that it is not easy is all the more reason that you need to, you need to face those feelings. You need to work through them and you need to build a healthy relationship with failure. Um, so if you're at that point, uh, you know, you're, I think it's really important to remember that the best person to make a judgment call on this is you, especially if it's your, your venture, right? Uh, you can take advice from people, you can hear them out, but you know, you know, this thing better than anyone else. You're the one who's put in the effort, you know, exactly how much effort you put and you, you are the best person, person to measure the results of it as well. Um, and it helps to have a bit of a wider uh, perspective um, in, in the sense that, you know, uh, measuring success is um, honestly a little bit overrated, I would say, because we usually measure it, especially if it's a venture, with you know either how much money you made or how big of an impact you had outside right you almost never wonder what impact it had on you um what did you gain out of this experience perhaps you failed but did you learn something 
And the answer almost always is absolutely you did, right? You must have picked on so many things going through this experience. Uh, just going through hardship in itself, you know, it, it strengthens you in a, in a way that you can't really quantify. Mm-hmm. Um, I know for a fact today that, uh, if, if, you know, um, regardless of what whatever happens in my current career, I can always go back and work for a big company and, you know, be a better than most uh, software engineer, you know, probably really good mm-hmm. if I had to take a guess. And I would probably uh, do it comfortably, you know. Why? Because because I've been through shit here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that has hardened me, yeah. you know. Um, and so if you're faced with that kind of a difficult decision uh, of labeling this venture as a failure, which I do think has a lot of negative connotations to it, maybe you want to pick a different term, I think I've got it. Yeah. <laughs> Experience. <laughs> um, or or just failure. You know, I think I've yeah. come to terms with it that it's not a bad word. It's not a bad word at all. Um, and if you are faced with that kind of a decision, it's important to sit down and really, really understand what the experience has been like, mm-hmm. uh, what impact has it had on you. And if you can say that you're walking away right now with something bigger than what you expected or, you know, something that you can't measure, then it's, it's worth it. Yeah. This is exactly why I wanted you on the show. <laughs> Precisely what you just shared right there. I think it really is even the word quitting, mm. the word failure, it just has so much like people just frown upon it when they first hear of it. It's like, oh, they quit, um, yeah. they gave up. But honestly, it takes courage to even quit mm. or to acknowledge that you failed. It that alone takes courage. And as you said, you must have learned something yeah. that will shape you for the for the years to come. You must have gone through something mm. that will. Um, really influence what you do moving forward so it's not like it's wasted but it's how you look at it and how you the language you use to describe what happened it's like okay you went through this chapter of your life how do you want to tell this chapter of your life yeah and you know just like some thoughts that are coming to my mind right now it this this sort of um, feeling or this sort of unhealthy relationship with failure it is i really do believe it's largely cultural Mm. it's not you who has arrived at this conclusion or this kind of feeling it's the it's the family you grew up in the society that you grew up in because you know you compare it to let's say a a country like uh, like america right and you see people there celebrate this sort of like iterative process they're like okay, you've done some real shit, you know, like, uh, you know what you're talking about. And it's so uh, bizarre, almost, to see this uh, being celebrated in especially the startup ecosystem, like you hear about founders who quit college, and that's, uh, you know, who got into Stanford, and then they quit. (laughs) And that's like a badge of honor, right? Um, And it's so interesting, even, uh, I think there is actually an active program by uh, the Thiel Foundation, you know, Peter Thiel and his foundation, where they actually pay students to quit college. I heard about this. Yeah. And just work on something that they want to work. And I feel like that is exactly the kind of um, encouragement or, or motivation you need to break the mold, support you need from, from you know, the, the larger ecosystem that you're part of just so you build a healthy relationship with failure. Mm. Uh, so it's important to remember that if you're feeling this way, it's probably your social programming uh, rather than there being a lot of substance in uh, in it, you know? Mm, I love that. I love that. Speaking of culture and social programming, I'm just curious now, just kind of looping back to earlier in the conversation. So nowadays, you know, how... Like, I'm curious to know, like, 
how does your family view your current mm, career? Yeah. Um, I, I have to say, I think they were supportive of my choices along the way. Mm -hmm. I don't think they understood it. Mm -hmm. I think it was foreign to them. I think it was new to them. I think I, I, I come from a family uh, who mostly played it very safe. Mm -hmm. um, I do have an elder sister who's uh, who's been very rebellious and she always <laughs> did her own thing. So I had a bit of like, you know, a bit of precedence mm -hmm. that way. But uh, I, I would have to say kudos to my parents uh, for never once like doubting it, uh, doubting what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, I think they had some genuine concerns at points, which they presented in very respectful uh, questions. Mm -hmm. And I answered them. Today, I think uh, they understand it a lot more. Mm -hmm. Today also, I think I'm at a point where, um, you know, at least I can uh, I can sustain myself. Perhaps I'm not earning as much as my peers, um, but you know, I'm not uh, I'm not on, out on the streets. I'm not. Mm. I don't need help. You know, mm. uh, so they understand it a lot better now. And I think m me having talked about it in length from different perspectives has also opened up their worldview about how the world works because yeah. they come from a very different world mm. back then I think especially in India it was a it was a uh you know a lot more basic living getting by kind of an attitude uh, and today it has completely shifted um and so I think they understand a lot better and there's they they're like okay we don't really know exactly what you're doing <laughs> or uh, what is it that you're building and how, like what are people paying you for but uh they're a lot more supportive and they understand it uh, mm. from a distance <laughs> i love that i think um that reminds me a lot of my parents as well i'm an only child oh. um and my parents still don't really understand like yeah. what's a podcast <laughs> um my dad last year last Christmas actually I called my, my dad my parents last Christmas and he said so you just talk <laughs> on the internet and you make money on the internet and I was like yeah let's just say that okay um yeah that's the extent of their understanding yeah. of podcasting let's just say <laughs> um so I think now that we're starting to near the end of our conversation there was so much mm -hmm. um so much helpful insights that you shared today. I want to just make a little pivot okay. and talk about music. Oh, because okay. that was something that must have been a big part of your life at yeah. some point. Yeah. So, like, I'm just curious, what does music look like in your life to today? Today, mm -hmm. mm. so this is a little bit more recent, I think, a few months back. Um, I made a very conscious effort of going back to music as a student um so back in india i think when i was 13 or 14 i uh i started learning music um very specifically indian classical music um and there was there's a great institute for it called gandharv um in delhi and they had a great center there so i just went for it um, and I think, uh, once again, I think I have to thank my parents for this push. Um, you know, in fact, they were the ones who encouraged me. They were like, yeah, your, you know, studies are good and fine, but uh, explore this side as well. Um, so I think I studied it for about two years. And um, and the, I have very fond memories of those, those lessons, you know. Um, they were almost a saving grace um, through what otherwise was, was a pretty shitty schooling experience, I would say, because uh, it's just crazy, I think, uh, the amount of competition you are, mm. you're forced into, uh, especially if you're half good at studies, mm -hmm. there's suddenly so much expectations on you. It's like, mm -hmm. this is your path, buddy, you know? Gotta gotta get those marks. Gotta get those <laughs> grades. Um, so I think music at that point was almost an escape from that craziness into something that was uh, a lot more, 
um, you know, just just an experience rather than uh, rather than a goal. Um, so I I had very fond memories of it, and the only reason I stopped is because I ended up moving to Singapore. Mm. Um, I was fortunate to get the scholarship to do my junior college here, and I just had to put an end to my life back mm. back in Delhi. Mm. Um, and you know that was I don't know how many years back. Um, and recently, and this is, I think, uh, a, a bit of randomness as well um, that happens in life. You know, I was on Facebook. I don't don't ask me why. I I'm not on Instagram, but <laughs> I had a Facebook account, and I guess you know, once in three months, I I check in to see what's up. <laughs> that's mm-hmm. the that's the extent of my social media. I think that's gonna be a joke. <laughs> later on but um so i went back on facebook and i saw an update from my music teacher back then he was like oh i'm taking online classes please reach out if you if you're interested and i was like let me do that yeah so i reached out to him and we connected after so many years um and i was like this is it. I'm just not not even going to think about it. I'm just going to do it. Mm. Just once a week, uh, music lesson, uh, going back to your roots in some sense. Mm. Um, and I think that is uh, the most active sort of musical part of my life these days. It's, uh, you know, once a week, I take this lesson. Most of the other days I'm practicing. I'm, I'm trying to understand it better. Just, just being a student again mm-hmm. is such a great feeling. Mm. Uh, yeah. I mean, otherwise, like I, I like um, uh, just actively participating in music in general. Mm-hmm. Um, I ended up uh, finding this group on Meetup, uh, which is like a free jam uh, sort of a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, this dude who's moved here from Hong Kong a few years back, he was like, "I used to do this back in Hong Kong. I want to Hong Kong. I want to bring this concept to Singapore. Mm-hmm. Just you know, get people together." Uh, you, you don't have to do an amazing job, just jam. Mm. And so I connect with them. So I do that once in a while. And uh, I think that's pretty much the extent of uh, music right now in my life. So does everyone play a different instrument? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is more of a traditional sort of a band setting. You've got okay. like the, the instrumentalists and you can, you can, you know, sing or you can play things and oh. you can you can switch around. It's a very free sort of uh, concept. I like it. I see. Yeah. Okay. So cool. Mm. Okay. So as we start to wrap up today, I'm just going to ask you a few miscellaneous sure. um, fun questions, let's yeah. just say. So besides um, classical Indian music, mm. what what do you listen to? What do I listen to? Most mm-hmm. these days. Well, that's uh, I think that's a question that doesn't have a straight answer. I think I listen to nothing. No, I listen to I think all sorts of things. Okay. Um, it's really don't have a very specific taste in music. I enjoy like just everything from like rock mm. to sometimes blues. Mm. Um, you know, I like a little bit of slow music here and there. Mm. I can listen to Bollywood. That's mm. how I grew up. It's mm. familiar to me. Yeah. I don't these days so much. Mm. But every once in a while, some of my friends would force me to listen to this song because it's just so amazing. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's really good. <laughs> um, so it's a little bit all over the place. Um, yeah, it's uh, it depends on my mood, you know, in the, in the month <laughs> mm-hmm. or in the year or where I'm at in life. I think there's music for all sorts of emotions or occasions that, that find you. Mm, awesome. I see. I see. Okay. Rapid fire miscellaneous slash fun question number two. Okay. Um, what was your biggest culture shock when you moved here to Singapore? Wow. It's been a while, but could you remember? It's been a while. Culture shock. I think it was just so safe. (laughs) That was shocking to me. Oh, yeah, I agree. I I agree. Just going out at night at 3 a.m., no no big deal. You just walk down the streets, no threats. 
Yeah. You know, or leaving your wallet on the table as you sit down and you eat, you leave your phone and wallet on the table. Yeah. Not <laughs> leaving your door locked. Like I'm, I should mm -hmm. probably not say this on a public <laughs> forum, but no, I mean, I lock my doors sometimes. But these kind of things, I was like, this is crazy. How? <laughs> Yeah. That's the first thing that strikes me, I think, which is a very positive and underrated thing about Singapore. You know, mm -hmm. um, I've had a love-hate relationship with this place, <laughs> uh, which has, I think, eventually morphed into respect and love more than anything. Mm -hmm. These are the kind of things that are very rare around the world. I agree. I really resonate with that. Yeah. Okay. Final question. Um. Hmm. I'm making these questions up on the spot, by the sure. way. For the listeners, I'm literally making these questions up on the spot. <laughs> and there are no notes, by the way. I'm not looking, we're not looking that's, at any notes. That's so crazy, I'm Cheryl. I was just gonna, you know, I was thinking this, but I might just say this because like, <laughs> this is the most, I think, um, improv conversation that we're having. Like, I see you, not, you don't have any notes on you. You didn't send me any questions or thinking points. You're like, we're just gonna have a chat. Yeah. And that is, I think, pretty cool. I think uh, that kind of authenticity and, and uh, approach is very unique. And I yeah. really hope the audience can just feel the sincerity in your sharings and in your story. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm glad that we were able to do this so casually, um, like without like prompts or like scripts or any yeah. notes. Like literally, there's like nothing. We're yeah. just looking at the Zoom video right now. Yeah. Um, I really hope the audience can feel the sincerity in. The question then in your sharing as well. Okay, final question. Favorite place to eat in Singapore? Ooh. I'm asking for myself, I'm by the way. For yourself. That's a tough one. Um, I must I must admit that I am not a foodie. Okay. So take my recommendation with a pinch of salt. Okay. Um I recently went to uh this place called Herbie War, which is a vegetarian Japanese restaurant. Okay. And that is very ironic, I know. Yeah. But I think they do an amazing job of it. And they're actually quite nearby at, at Fortune Center. Okay. And I just had a very spiritual experience eating there. It was, the food was so good. I overate, which I usually don't. <laughs> and by the end of it, I was just like, this is it. I could die right here. Okay, so <laughs> dish that you would recommend me to order when I go, and I'm gonna message you after I go. Sure. Uh, I had I, the life changing dish for me. There was these bacon wraps, and obviously it's not real bacon because okay, right, right, right. it's a vegetarian <laughs> place. But um, I've heard a lot about bacon, you know, from my meat eating friends. They're like, hey, you see the face of God when you eat bacon. I wouldn't I was go like, that far. Yeah, I don't okay. know either because I've never tried it. And I don't know, it was clearly not bacon, but it tasted <laughs> so good. Uh, it just is really was great. So I'm just going to say that one for now. Okay, well, <laughs> you will probably hear from me soon okay. after I go eat those bacon wraps. At the sorry. The okay. wedgie bacon wraps. <laughs> so with that, Shubham, we are at the end of our conversation for today. So before we wrap up, I know you don't, have social you don't, you're not active on social mm. media but two questions number one um where can people find you mm. after they listen to the show and they want to connect with you uh how can they get in touch with you and could you tell us a bit more about um how people can potentially work with you and mm. interpret that and in however you however way sure you're yeah um so yeah that's true i'm not really big on social media i'm not really out there but in general i think you can maybe find me on linkedin uh, by my name um, and just you know drop a message in the connection request I'd be happy to happy to connect with you Great. it'll be in the show notes people <laughs> yeah um, I, I think I should do a better job of this though like in the future um, I'll think about it thanks for the planting that <laughs> seed in my head and um, how could I work with people so one thing that I want to do more of is um you know if you're early in your career um you're you're thinking about a lot of things especially if you're in tech because that's the field that I know best and if you want to just talk through it uh you know uh talk about career or what you want to do I'd be more than happy to have a chat with you and just 
think it through with you, be your sounding board. Uh, that's just something that I think I've been meaning to do a lot more of. Um, so would be would be happy to help there. Okay. And in... Oh, sorry. One more thing. Yeah. If by chance you happen to run a Shopify store, you know, we are absolutely here to help. <laughs> that's Airboxer for you. Mm -hmm. uh, we can help you understand your data in a way that you'd probably take you two to three data analysts to, mm -hmm. uh, to get the hang of. So if you're anything in e-commerce, Shopify, feel free to reach out to me. We've got tons of things that you could just, you know, take it, um, take with you. Great. That was exactly what my question was going to be. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So all the links, all the relevant links and information will be in the show notes uh, below. So whether you're listening on a podcast platform or on YouTube, you will find all the necessary links below. So with that, Shivam, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being the first guest ever <laughs> on this brand new series it was a delightful conversation i am so grateful that you're here i'm so grateful that we crossed paths and yeah. that we were able to get to know each other a little bit more and um i got to know more about your your story your perspectives and now we're here so i'm <laughs> so grateful for that so thank you so much and thank you for having me i think i really enjoyed this conversation you know yeah thanks a lot so with that, everyone, thank you so much for listening and I'll see you in the next one. Bye, everyone.